The warm embrace of summer had always been a cherished time in our household, largely because it meant countless nights spent under the starry sky, with our makeshift outdoor cinema playing a central role. Our backyard was transformed into a personal theater, boasting an expansive projection screen and a collection of plush outdoor furniture. It was a sanctuary of sorts, a place where my daughter, Ava, and I bonded over classic movies and late-night conversations. Ava, at 16, had grown into an inquisitive and brave young woman, often unfazed by the eerie stories and true crime documentaries she consumed with keen interest. One particular evening, as the cicadas played their symphony, we settled into our usual spots. The air was thick with the fragrance of blooming night flowers and the distant murmur of the countryside. That night's pick was a thriller, and as the plot thickened, the world around us faded into an afterthought. It must have been around 3 a.m. when the stillness of the night was suddenly interrupted by a peculiar clicking noise. At first, it seemed like a benign sound, perhaps an insect or a natural occurrence. However, as I focused, it morphed into something more alarming. It was akin to the sound of an electrical circuit misfiring, interspersed with a soft crackling reminiscent of the fire slowly consuming dry wood. Our farm, sprawling over several acres, was surrounded by dense woodland, and the thought of a fire out there was a frightening prospect. I hit the pause button, the movie's suspenseful music cutting off abruptly. The night was now eerily silent except for that odd sound. Ava, sitting beside me, leaned closer and whispered, Mom, do you hear that too? Her voice carried a hint of anxiety, a rare occurrence for her. Remembering the practicalities of rural life, I reached for the heavy-duty flashlight we always kept nearby. It was a robust, high-beam tool, capable of illuminating the darkest corners of our property. I pointed it towards the open field behind our seating area. The beam cut through the night, but strangely, it seemed to dissolve into the darkness about 10 feet away. It was as if the night itself was a thick curtain, not allowing the light to penetrate its depths. Confused, I moved the flashlight sideways. This time, the beam behaved as expected, casting elongated shadows across the ground and illuminating the grass and the occasional bush. Ava, her eyes wide with a mixture of curiosity and fear, clutched my arm. Mom, something isn't right, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Her reaction was unsettling. Ava, who had always shown a fascination with the mysterious and unknown, had never displayed fear like this before. There's something in the field, she continued, her gaze fixed on the darkness beyond the reach of our flashlight. We should go inside. Now. We hurried back to the house, the back of my neck prickling with an uneasy sensation. Once inside, I knew I couldn't leave our expensive projector and speakers outside, vulnerable to the elements or potential theft. I steeled myself and stepped back out into the night, the odd clicking sound now absent. I quickly gathered our equipment, my movements brisk and efficient. However, a nagging feeling urged me to scan the area one last time. Raising the flashlight, I swept the beam across the field. For a moment, the light flickered, as if something or someone had momentarily crossed its path. A shiver ran down my spine. Panic took hold, and I dashed back into the safety of our home, locking the door behind me. Ava, who had been waiting anxiously, looked at me for answers I didn't have. We sat in the living room, the silence between us filled with unspoken questions. Later, after Ava had retreated to her room, I turned to the internet for some semblance of an explanation. I stumbled upon various accounts and legends, one of which resonated with our experience. The Glimmer Man. Descriptions of fleeting shadows and inexplicable light phenomena matched what we had encountered. The more I read, the more the pieces seemed to fit, yet it left me with a sense of deep unease. In the days that followed, the incident became a topic of much discussion and speculation. Ava's curiosity was piqued, and she spent hours researching similar phenomena, while I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched whenever I was near that field. The outdoor cinema nights were put on hold indefinitely, and the once comforting space of our backyard now carried an air of mystery and apprehension. Though life eventually returned to its routine, the memory of that night lingered, a constant reminder of the unknown that lurks in the shadows of our seemingly familiar world. On the chilly evening of October 17, 2010, my world changed forever. 
That was the day when my mother's mental state took a sharp and irreversible turn. My parents had been in a rocky marriage for nearly two decades. My mother, who had always battled her inner demons, had managed to keep them at bay until that fateful year. Things started to unravel when I left for university in 2005, she stopped taking her medication for depression, and her mental health rapidly deteriorated. At that time, I was too young to recognize the signs of her emerging bipolar disorder, which only became clear to me much later. For my father, it was a battle he could no longer fight. Her refusal to continue her treatment was the final blow, leading to their divorce in 2007. Post-divorce, my mother was a shell of her former self. Her diagnosis of bipolar disorder coupled with borderline personality disorder made her life a tempestuous journey of emotional highs and lows. Watching her disintegrate was like watching a part of my mother fade into oblivion. After the divorce, my dad left her the family home, a charming house with a large, inviting bay window, bathed in natural light. Once a symbol of warmth and family, the house turned into a place of shadows and sadness after my father's departure. Her behavior became increasingly erratic, the house mirroring her mental state dark, neglected, and unwelcoming. I attributed the oppressive atmosphere of the home to the emotional turmoil of the divorce and my mother's spiraling condition, but I later began to question that assumption. The situation reached a breaking point on October 17, 2010. I received a distressing call from my father. A concerned neighbor, not seeing our family dog in its usual spot by the bay window for days, had checked on my mother using a spare key. He discovered the dog lifeless in the bathroom and found my mother bedridden, physically weakened from prolonged inactivity. The cause of the dog's death remained a mystery, though my aunt, who later helped clean the house, found our cat tragically crushed under furniture. My mother spent the subsequent years in various facilities, oscillating between catatonic states and brief moments of lucidity. The responsibility of cleaning the cluttered, hoarder-like house fell on me. Initially, the house felt suffocating, a stark contrast to its former self. However, as I cleaned and organized, the house gradually shed its gloomy aura. Yet, the house had a peculiar way of oscillating between light and darkness. There were moments when it felt almost cheerful, only to suddenly be engulfed in a heavy, oppressive atmosphere. This duality of the house was unsettling. One day, while my boyfriend and I were discussing renovations in the living room, we heard the unmistakable sound of the front door opening. The old creaky door was a challenge to operate, requiring considerable effort to open and close. We rushed to check, only to find it firmly shut, with no indication of it being tampered with. Another time, we were startled by the sound of something crashing in the attic, directly above us. It sounded as if someone had smashed a glass object with force. We thoroughly searched the attic, finding nothing amiss, no signs of intrusion or broken objects. This inexplicable incident left us unnerved, questioning the very reality of our senses. As time passed, the house seemed to reflect and amplify the turmoil in our relationship. Our arguments became more frequent and intense, and I started to feel a heavy, depressive energy enveloping me, unlike anything I had experienced before. One evening, after a particularly heated argument, I returned home to an overwhelming sense of darkness. The lights were on, but the house felt consumed by a stifling cold shadow. In a moment of desperation, I confronted the oppressive darkness, shouting into it, demanding it to leave. To my astonishment, it seemed to recede, and the house momentarily regained its lightness. These experiences led me to ponder the true nature of the house. Was it merely reflecting the emotional residue of my family's struggles, or was there something more, something inexplicable at play? The house, once a sanctuary, had become a mystery I could no longer unravel. Eventually, I made the difficult decision to leave the house and start anew. The mysteries of that house remain unsolved, leaving me to wonder if the darkness had always been there, lurking beneath the surface, or if it was a manifestation of my mother's and later my own psychological struggles. In that house, I frequently dreamt of a shadowy figure, a blend of ominous and mythical creatures, whispering cryptic messages. These dreams ceased the moment I left, leaving me with more questions than answers. The house was sold, and I moved on, yet the memories of those dark inexplicable occurrences linger, a reminder of a chapter in my life that defies rational explanation.
I'm a 28-year-old woman, and this eerie experience unfolded about a year ago. Until then, I was quite skeptical about anything supernatural. My babysitting job for three kids Lily, who's 11, Jason, 9, and little Emma, 5 changed all that. I've been their babysitter since Emma was just a baby, and we've had a great rapport, barring the usual temper tantrums typical for kids their age. They've always felt like part of my family. One weekend, their parents needed me for an extended period five days, while they were away on a trip. The first couple of nights were uneventful, but on the third night, things took a strange turn. We'd just finished watching a movie and were getting ready for bed. Emma, being the youngest, was a bit more challenging to settle down. The kids shared a room because Jason's was under renovation. After tucking Emma in, I headed downstairs to relax with some TV. That's when I heard the sound of a musical toy one I knew belonged to Emma. Thinking she'd sneak down to play, I went back upstairs, only to find all three sound asleep, no toys in sight. Puzzled, I checked the toy chest, the musical toy was nowhere to be found. Then, from downstairs, the toy's music played again, clear as day. Feeling a mix of fear and confusion, I went back down. To my astonishment, the toy was on the kitchen counter a place I'm certain it wasn't before. It was turned off, yet it suddenly chimed in with its melody. Startled, I quickly removed its batteries. Lily, hearing the commotion, asked me from the stairway what was wrong. Not wanting to alarm her, I reassured her it was nothing and told her to go back to sleep. I stored the batteries away and checked on the kids again. Lily, sensing my unease, mentioned Oliver, saying he liked to play with Emma's toys. Confused and frightened, I avoided further questions. That night, sleep eluded me. Did Lily also hear the toy? Was she accustomed to this? The next night, I managed a few hours of sleep until a faint whispering woke me up. It was coming from the kid's room. There, I found Lily awake on the floor. She spoke of Oliver, expressing his desire for my attention, claiming he felt ignored. The following day, Lily refused her lunch, concerned about Oliver not having his own. To ease the situation, I prepared an extra plate, as per Lily's guidance. When her parents returned, I shared the entire ordeal. The mother, looking shocked, sat me down and revealed a startling history. The house's previous occupants had lost their young son, Oliver, in an accident. Since moving in, Lily had often spoken to an invisible Oliver, having conversations and even arguments. The parents had researched the house's history, confirming the tragedy. They believed Oliver was harmless, a presence they had grown to accept. Hearing this, my perspective shifted. I felt empathy for Oliver. Despite the initial shock, I decided to continue babysitting. In subsequent visits, peculiar incidents like misplaced items happened, but they were less intimidating. This experience transformed my view on the paranormal, turning me from a skeptic to a believer. And that brings us to the end of our spine-chilling tale. Did it send shivers down your spine? If you found yourself captivated by this story, please show your support by hitting that like button and share your thoughts in the comments below. Your engagement is incredibly valuable, and it guides us in creating content that resonates with you. If these tales of the paranormal intrigue you, let me know. Your enthusiasm could lead to more eerie and mysterious stories being featured on our channel. So, don't hold back, let your voice be heard and be a part of our community's journey into the unknown. As we close this chapter, remember, there are countless more mysteries to explore and stories to be told. Keep watching, because our adventure into the paranormal world is far from over.